You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, get ready to hit the option block. All right, everybody, that rocking bit of tunage means it is time to rock out in the land of options. Yes, it is time for the option block. My name is Mark Longo coming at you live noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern here on this Thursday edition of the option block. Yep, we come at you every Monday and Thursday, noon central, (laughs) 1 p.m. Eastern there on the old option block. Of course, you can get us after the fact pretty much wherever you get your finer podcast programs and however you listen, make sure you hit us up. We do indeed like to hear from you guys. Joining me on the old program today, we've got a rotating cavalcade of stars. Let's start out. Let's go all the way out to the land of Fidelity, into that very squirmy, very painful hot seat. Done so by design, listeners. Got to make them squirm a little bit. We are joined today, holding down the Fidelity hot seat. He should be familiar with it. He likes a good... A good iron throne or two. He is the Song of Ice and Fire himself, Mr. Colin Songer from the Active Trader Strategy Desk over there in Fidelity Land. Mr. Song of Ice and Fire, welcome back to the program, sir. Oh, thanks for having me on. Uh, kind of preparing here to, to clean up of all the down trees and branches that have been going on because of all the wind. But uh, outside of that, I'm glad to be on. Yeah, I hear you guys up there in the Northeast having a little bit of fun up there these days. You know, they used to call it a nor'easter. Now I guess apparently it's a it's a bomb cyclone. Let's see if the bomb cyclone has also speared our compadre up there a little bit farther north and east of you. We're going out to the shores of Maine where we are joined, I hope. We shall see <laughs> if the bomb cyclone has speared him. The rock lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Gibonazzi from optionpit.com by way of Carmeline Capital. Mr. G, are you there, sir? Have you indeed survived the bomb cyclone? Uh, I have, but uh, many trees have come down. Many, many trees, no power. Um, I keep putting off this solar battery pack thing for my place, and I, <laughs> I think I'm going to have to bite the bullet this spring Uh-oh. and do it. You're going to go um, musk? You're going to get a super battery in the house? I think so. It just, uh, it, it, it just makes sense because we don't really have a huge power bill, but 
Um, I think, to be honest, it, it, it would make sense being in the hinterlands at this point. But we got a lot of trees, and they do cut down a lot of trees, but still always manage. Another one manages to just just be derooted and just plopped onto a power line. So thankfully, nothing around my house, though. <laughs> we have the same problem here in downtown Chicago all the time. You know, trees coming down, taking down power <laughs> lines, crazy gusts of wind. All sorts of mad nature. You know, we have people stealing our clams down here, too, right on the river here. You know, it's crazy what happens here in the heart of the city. Let's go a little bit beyond the city now, out to a more quiet, more tranquil. I, I think they're fairly bomb, cyclone-free. We shall see. We are joined by Uncle Mike Tussaud coming in at us from the offices of St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, sir, how go things? Have you indeed survived or perhaps dodged yet another bomb cyclone as well, sir? You know what? I don't know if I've ever experienced a bomb cyclone. I've been interviewed on Chicago News as a microburst witness. I've experienced a lot of other weather incidents in my life, but I don't know if I've ever experienced a bomb cyclone. There you go. He's got to move to the hinterlands, and you too can have the joys of, of Mother Nature at its most ferocious. As we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, let's move away from weather phenomenon into the phenomenon known as the markets today. A bit of an interesting one. It seemed like everyone had a, you know, a joyous start to the session. It seemed like there may be a tentative deal in the works over there for Brexit between uh, the EU and the UK, and that at least gave the markets a nice little boost, a little a little pep in their step to start the session. Most of them threatening up about half a percent or so. Now we're coming into showtime. Seems like some of that bloom off the rose a little bit. Most of the market's still up, but giving up some of that upside. In fact, the Dow now pretty much unched on the day. Uh, the S&P up a mere about a third of a percent. It was up about half a percent earlier in the day. And the Nasdaq up about a quarter of a percent. It was up about half a percent there as well. Gold up. Oil, take a little bit of a break, 53 and change if you want more gold and oil. Stay tuned for Twifo in a little bit, sir. We'll be getting to all that good stuff in a little bit. Our old friend Vix Cash then has got another day to get a little bit of juice back in because it's given up some of the ghost <laughs> since our last show. Uh, at exactly now 13.99 coming into showtime. Puts it off about a handle from where it was this time last show. It needs to rally a little bit to get back up to my crystal ball prognostication. But we've got a good... 24 hours or so, and we know that might as well be a century in volatility time because <laughs> it's, we've seen crazy things happen even during the course of that show. So a whole day, a lot can happen. I'm not too concerned. Our old friend Vivix coming off a bit as well, down to about 92 and a half. That puts it off. Not quite four handles, but pretty close from where it was this time last show. And our old friend VXX also feeling the downside love down to about 21.3. So all of you who are lined up on the 20 strike, maybe maybe you got a chance this month. Down about one, almost one and a quarter points from this time last show. So a, a far cry from the 26 or so that it hit middle, middle of last week. So a lot of erosion kicking in back there. Let's, uh, let's go back the way we came. Let's start in the land of Uncle Mike, sir, while you're dodging weather phenomena. What is, what is on your markets radar today, sir? I would say the 3,000 mark. I think this this is always an exciting time for me. Uh, I've been talking about the 3,000 magnet on the S&P for a while now. Well, ever since we've been hitting it, it seems. And this is very much a fork in the road type of time for my analysis in that I think if we can have some good earnings and this could push the markets over the 3,000 mark, I could see uh, greener pastures ahead for the market, uh, more um, good things for the bulls out there. But uh, if we don't, then this could also be a time to where uh, we could pull back. I think that if uh, for the bulls out there, 3,000 is a tough nut to crack. I think it's been tough for us to get over it. I think it's been a hard time uh, making it through that number, but um, we'll see what earnings have to do with it. Um, silver's been holding steady, uh, so not a ton of movement there. Um, bonds, we always got to continue to keep an eye on that, but I think the main thing that we're watching right now is very macro for the time being, but also micro from the standpoint that we have uh, – we are in uh, we uh, with earnings, a tongue twister there. My apologies for that. So um, 
a lot of things going on right now. I think over the course of the next week or so with things playing out, combined with the fact that we're at a very, very key number in the S&P, in my humble opinion, of course, uh, it's going to be an exciting few shows that we have. And, of course, we can't um, uh, discount the fact that uh, a random tweet could come out at any moment. Uh, I think the only... Big tweet today, I believe the congressman from Baltimore passed away, and so uh, President Trump tweeted his warm regards for that, uh, even though it sounds like those two are very much political enemies, but that's the way it goes in politics. They seem to take the gloves off for, or I'm sorry, they seem to um, uh, play nice when uh, it's serious matters like that. So uh, that's what I'm looking at, and I think that um, it's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of news coming up over the course of the next couple of weeks, both... Um, uh, market-related, and macro. A lot of news indeed. Let's see if the news will continue to spare the Rock Lobster here for the rest of the show as he's pondering the magic of solar power. Mr. Rock Lobster, before the lights turn off on you, sir, what is catching your eye? What is, what is lighting up your tape today? So is, is Overby still trying to claim uh, his 20 VIX victory <laughs> he, yet? He probably will be again. If we threaten that level again, I will probably get another call or email from him saying, hey, where's my Tesla at? He wants a well, Tesla. It, wants- I, I thought I was like a 14 handle, I thought. That's where I was. I thought I was I'm, – I'm not looking too bad, I think, for the show. No, I think you're pretty good because you were on the dark side while I was, I was leaning more towards slightly off a little bit. I, I will pull up our exact prognostications while you regale us with what's, uh, what's on your tape, and I will find exactly where we were, sir, in a moment. Well, I'm uh, – so at least from a power outage point of view uh, – there's so much power. There's 150,000 people out. Uh, so, <laughs> Wilbur, we're waiting for a while. Um, anyway, um, I think there is a little bit to the Brexit thing. Um, so, VIX is getting a bit of a bid on a Thursday, which generally means so there was kind of aggressive taking the weekend out uh, into the week into um, today. And now they're kind of putting it back in a little bit. So, you know, when you're like, well, you know, what does that mean? Uh, It means that the market is looking for a little bit more of a move. Um, The November 15 straddle, which is about a month out, is uh, about 830, 840, something like that. That's a pretty solid 2.5% move. uh, expected move at a um, at a uh, um, a twelve volatility. So I they put a the little bit of a put the vol back in a little bit at the money. Um, why would they do that? Um, when I say they, it's like so the liquidity providers do uh, react and respond. So even though you might see the sigma as the way they are, the at the money vol looks like it's gone up a little bit and. I think the reason is, um, um, quite simply, I, the market is looking for some kind of good news. Uh, a little bit more news out of this break that I think the, uh, there's a vote this weekend. So I wouldn't. It would not surprise me to see a VIX hold the bid and SPY hold the three thousand level. Um, because you know this has been kind of like a basically I would call like a small market negative that the fact that. The EU and and uh, and and Britain were still you know so at odds over this stuff. But if it gets settled, you know the market likes certainty. And so anytime you take you knock out that uh, un- an uncertainty peg, uh, you're uh, doing okay. Um, the other thing I'm looking at is like Netflix earnings were not as bad as I think people thought. Um, so I think overall the the tone at least underlying performance. From companies looks okay. Uh, trade uncertainty still up there. I think this Hong Kong thing might get in the way. Like you know, the more U.S. senators now are pressing uh, and congressmen, <laughs> clearly not the NBA, <laughs> but <laughs> the uh, uh, congressmen are kind of press, pressing now on this issue. Um, that will complicate the trade stuff. So you know, we could see more of this. I think. Uh, that's why this 3,000 level has been so hard. So uh, to me, I always try to inflect off 3,000 one way or the other. Um, maybe not anymore for this week, but looking for you know two, three weeks down the road uh, if we can get anything done. So that's, 
that's kind of catching my eye and the fact that, you know, VIX is trading at a one month low. So or it was yesterday anyway, uh, or for a while today. So uh, I don't expect much to change there. The last thing I would say is the future premium in the vol products is sky high. Um, I think it's at a level uh, and it's it's contracted considerably since yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to say considerably. It's a uh, it was a little over three dollars yesterday. Now it's a little less than three dollars, about two seventy five. Huge future premium for a fourteen handle in VIX. This is huge. I, I'm just trying to think of the last time I saw it this big. Probably like I don't know when T VIX was had a net asset value problem when you know all the uh, when. The, that that product was buying so many futures, it was jacking up the future premium, and that was several years ago. So, really quickly, really quickly, you regale listeners who don't know what you mean by future premium. Okay, so the the deal is is generally with about thirty days to go with VIX at twelve, the time value for the future is around two dollars uh, for the front month future. So the futures trade at a big premium to VIX cash. So right now. If you bought, if you try to buy VIX, right, um, that cash level is thirteen eighty four, but the futures are sixteen fifty six. So if you're buying, so because of the way the VIX options trade, that means the at the money is closer to seventeen than fourteen. So if you're buying options now, you're buying all, you're buying almost a seventeen VIX level, um, and. What that means is generally, like the liquidity providers, there's no willing sellers to bring that future premium lower. Um, so, in general, at high future premium, historically has meant people are nervous about something. Um, nervous about something you can't quite put your finger on. I think we used to joke about it on the show that the reason for the volatility has yet to reveal itself. We try to, of course, we always try to put a Star Wars reference in to make Longo happy, but. Right now, it's extremely high future premium, like, and we're almost 14-ish VIX. So what that does is that sets up a potential for one is if VXX or the, the futures will absorb a move up in VIX cash. So it's almost like we're expecting a move back to 16, um, some kind of compression that way. And so VXX doesn't move really well on the upside right now, but – if whatever that worry does not come to pass, there's tremendous downside potential for the vol products. So, you know, I'm, what I'm doing in my vol newsletter is trying to load up on that downside, but then provide like explosive upside. So it's kind of like we're either going to rock it up in vol or the vol collapses again. It's because that future premium is sitting there. I know it might be a little obscure, but that's kind of how the products trade. So, um, and I and that's definitely something that I'm watching because. I have we haven't seen this number this high except for this week. Um, so you know, usually whenever there's an extreme in the vol products in future premium or curve or something like that, there's a lot of ways that I look at it. But it's it's a reason for concern, like because that's remember those are market players, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, like all expressing their opinion in one place, and that's why the the VIX curve. If you want to become a better long short spx trader you should really get get to know the vix curve of course you could buy my vix made easy class or vxx made easy class to help you with that but what it does is you you always want to see when that vol signal looks like it's going to kink really hard or you're going to it's going to the rubber band essentially for vol is being stretched um and we're and we're at that right now um so i positioned for that and then i kind of sit and wait and see what happens and uh I'm definitely in the position and sit and wait mode. Well, who know who else is sitting and waiting is the Song of Ice and Fire holding down the Fidelity hot seat there. Mr. Song of Ice and Fire, this has got to be the part of the season you like because we're always awash in macro news these days. There's no shortage of that. But it is nice to have the micro to sink our teeth into again. And we are once again back in the teeth of it. Netflix, Beamer, a bunch of every freaking bank on the planet all coming out this week. So there are earnings to sink our teeth into uh, what's been going on, what's been lighting up your tape, what are the Fidelity clients, what are they trading in this, once again, maybe mildly micro-focused week here? I think that was a pretty good guess of what our uh, top security is being traded here by our customers. is definitely Netflix. So, uh, you know, obviously because of related to their earnings release, um, 
Strangely enough, 43% of the orders by uh, Fidelity customers were buy orders, 57% being sells. Uh, currently trading at two ninety six thirty eight, dollars uh, up $10.18, which is about uh, just over 3.5%. Uh, with Netflix, I mean, it is still below its 200-day moving average, but it's it's pushed above if it, uh, its 50-day moving average and is currently above its 20-day moving average. Uh, it initially, from the open, pushed and broke outside that upper Bollinger Band there. Uh, but it's it's starting to find a little weakness as the day goes on. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, so uh, when we take a look at the volume call to put ratio on that, uh, it's actually right in line with the 90-day average volume, um, where uh, it's just a little bit more call paper uh, being traded compared to put. Uh, now, next one on the list is Roku. This seems to just try to make its way in this top five you could tell it just wants to be a regular. Uh, so right now, as 53% of the orders placed by Fidelity customers are buy orders, um, it's right now trading at 137 spot, 80, which is up $5.30, uh, which is just slightly over 4%. Now, currently, it's above all its moving averages. Now, strangely enough, the 20-day moving average is between that 50 and 200-day moving average, but price is above them all. Uh, and as well with Roku, it's actually pushing outside the upper Bolger band as well. Uh, so that's pretty interesting development there. And we're seeing that uh, there's about one and a half uh, call paper to one put trade uh, compared to its 90 day average of being about one and a quarter um, calls traded to every one put. Now, next in the list in the number three spot was uh, IBM once again. Earnings related. Uh, so it's right now currently trading at 133 uh, spot, 52, which is down $8.59, which is uh, over 6% down on the day. Fidelity customers um, have 74% buy orders in uh, for this particular security. Now, IBM, uh, with that announcement, is now below the lower Bollinger Band. It's below the 200-day moving average. As a matter of fact, it's below all its moving averages. Uh, so, so far here today, when we look at that call-to-put ratio, it's it's a one-of-a-quarter um, call to everyone put paper traded compared to its 90-day average of about, um, we'll say, one spot, four, five calls, paper to one put. Uh, now, now let's get to a little bit of a different area. Now, I know everyone's probably heard of this. Uh, so symbol H, that's Hotel Echo Papa Alpha. That's right, Hepion Pharmaceuticals. I know everyone has heard of it. Uh, so it had came out with some positive data on liver disease treatment. Now, this one doesn't have any options to trade for it, but this has uh, caught the eye of Fidelity customers. Although 52% ha- have put in buy orders on it, it's currently trading uh, four dollars and twenty cents. It's up a dollar seventy, so that's about sixty-eight percent up just on today here, and it has pushed its way above its twenty, above its fifty, above its upper Bollinger Band, but it still maintains to be below its two hundred day moving average. Uh, and the last of our top fives is going to be Kronos at uh, symbol C R O N. That one has 56% of the orders placed by Fidelity customers are buy orders. Uh, so it's currently trading 877, which is up 37 cents, which is uh, over 4%, uh, just under 4.5. Uh, so right now it's below, uh, very interesting enough, it's below its 15, 200 day moving average and is clinging onto that 20 day moving average, just trying to stay above it. Um, but I thought it was fairly interesting to point out, it opened up right at that 50-day moving average and has just sold off from that level since. Um, and it did. It started opening up above that upper Bolger band and has sold off back inside of it. Uh, so interesting action going on here today. Now, the call-to-put ratio on Kronos was um, it was trading uh, one spot, three, one call, paper to one put. Uh, versus its 90-day average, which is actually almost two and a quarter call paper to one put. Uh, so this is being deemed because there's a little bit more put paper activity happening. 
So that's what Fidelity customers are trading so far here today. Thank you for that, Mr. Song of Ice and Fire. Let's see what the rest of the market is up to on this day, what they're trading. Coming into this portion of the show here, we're seeing VIX doing decent paper at about a little bit shy of a quarter of a million contracts, about 225 or so. That puts it about a little less than half of its ADB. SPY at about one and a half million, also a little less than half of its ADB as well. SPX closing in on 600,000 contracts. That puts it also pretty much well under half of its ADB. The Q's, about a quarter of a million contracts, a little bit north of that. The ADB, nearly 700,000, so pretty light out there as well. And the Russell, at least an IWM form, at about 180,000 contracts. That puts it shy of its ADB, which is nearly half a million contracts as well. Coming into the most active equity options for today, number 10. It cost you about 119,000 contracts to get into the top 10 today, which is a little bit better than it was last show. When was it 60, 70,000? That's all it took. That was a much lighter day. Today, Teva, number, number 10 there, the 119,000. Number 9 is Kron. That's ticker symbol C-R-O-N. That is at 120,000. That is the Kronos Group. If you are if you are intrigued, number eight, good old Facebook, a buck twenty six. Number seven, Microsoft, hundred twenty eight thousand. Number six, some car company begins with a T to Sla, I believe it's called, hundred sixty seven thousand contracts. Number six, number five, AMD, down to number five today, hundred seventy thousand. Number four, Roku, the aforementioned Roku. In fact, I do believe we have a, an OPR set up with some cool time iron butterflies going on in Roku. So if you missed that, stay tuned. Maybe we'll play it in between this show. And Twifo, interesting stuff. The Roku number three, I'm assuming number four, 176,000. Number three, Bank of America, 194,000. Numero dose there, Apple, 309. That means, wow, what could what can unseat Apple for the number one spot? Well, it's the Widowmaker, Netflix, at about 620,000 contracts. So pretty active paper out here. Quick scan to see where most of our biases lie today. Looks like the most biased paper is going on in Bank of America with about 70% of that paper Coming on the call side of the ledger, uh, you got looks like you guys are enjoying the return of earnings season out there today. We've got uh, Morgan popping off before the bell, I believe. Uh, yes, they were before the open, so we already saw them. We've got E Trade after the bell later tomorrow. We got Coca Cola, Amex, and Citizens Financial, amongst others. It was a pretty active week, mostly financials, but also Beamer in there, Netflix, a few others. You guys. Like to sink your teeth into more on the way, listeners. And there's more show on the way as we keep on rolling right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the odd block. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's get weird. Let's get wild. Let's get funky. A lot of you guys have asked us of late about the utility or perhaps the lack thereof of trading options on very cheap names. Well, let's see what our first name has to say about that. We're kicking things off with Malincrot PLC, (laughs) ticker symbol MINK, M-N-K. If you're curious, this is an Irish tax registered manufacturer of specialty pharmaceuticals, generic drugs, and imaging agents. So there you go. Uh, a stalwart, a regular here on the old odd block segment. Uh, trading today, get ready for it, listeners, $2.46, up actually 22 cents, or about 10%. So a good day here for Malincrot PMC, PLC here. A year ago, this thing was, <laughs> this looks like a pharma stock chart right here, Mr. Rock Lobster. This thing was trading $27.44 a year ago. So yeah, more than 10x. Where it is right now. It actually peaked, looks like, in November around 32 and change before beginning the great sell-off down to Christmas Eve. Only got down to about a mere 16 or so bucks before rallying again up to about 24, almost 25 in February. Hung, around, hung out there for a while until April and started selling off again. Got down to, by May, got down to 15 again. By late May, it was trading 9 and change. So a rough couple of months there, rough summer from Malincrot. Then it continued a long, slow ebb there where it got down to its 52 week low back in the beginning of September of buck 43. So this thing has seen, 
seen the highs and the lows over the course of the past year. So all that, fast forward to let's see what options paper is lighting up the tape. And on a fairly active day, this is one of the larger individual prints we actually saw going up in the equity options land today. So that should tell you something in and of itself. And it's some puts. Looks like some aggressive put love, Mr. Rock Lobster. It's the Jan 4 puts. So once again, we have an interesting choice of pretty deep in the money puts in a cheap name. We had one recently on, on another episode as well. 13,173 of these bad boys going up for 214. They were a buck 65 at 215 when this print went up over there on the SIBO. This is opening. There are earnings between now and January. There's a coming up. In November, so there is earnings baked into this, but Mr. Rock Lobster, a good thing. The good thing the Viceroy is in here because this one would probably tie him in knots. These people are paying almost the price of the stock. <laughs> Actually, before today, it pretty much was the price of the stock, pretty close to it for puts that are almost uh, not quite two handles, but a buck and change in the money that go out in January. What? <laughs> This one is, has all sorts of goodness to it. What's your spidey sense telling you about this one, sir? Uh-oh, did the bomb cyclone claim him? Are you gone, sir? I, I Sorry, I did. <laughs> it's my first show. Yes. It's my first yes, show. You're new to this. Because I, I was just doing some research on this one. Um, and, oh, my gosh, like, are they, are they an opioid producer? You know? <laughs> are they, is the person who uh, traded this, maybe they're taking opioids? Uh, you know, you got to look at some of these trades and it really makes you go, hmm, why, why do they do these things? Um, again, a real head scratcher uh, on this trade. It, it, clearly buying puts, clearly buying more puts than the open interest. Um, spending, what, 60 cents over parity for them. Uh, there has been a little bit of flutter up uh, on the possibility of some um, settlements on some of these cases. So I, you know, for listeners that are interested, I've been kind of slowly accumulating a little bit more long delta in some of these, like basically opioid related companies. Um, hasn't worked <laughs> yet. Let's just put it that way, not by a long shot. So, um why are they buying it? Do they want to hedge? Like, I, I, all I know is the Viceroy, his hat would be bright and purple, bright red right now. And he would be quite, he would be quite upset the fact that somebody was buying these puts. Um, I guess because you don't want to lose the last two bucks in the stock. I don't really know. Like, <laughs> I, it is a, uh, it is a mystery shrouded in an enigma because <laughs> this was a $30 stock and now it's two. Like the only way this makes any sense, it, it's got to be done with some stock, I would wager. That's the only way it makes a, a modicum of sense. The Delta neutral, it's about 600 some odd thousand contracts, which isn't that much, actually. Uh, maybe they did it one to one. Looking at the volume here, this is a little bit high on the volume today, about 10.2. I don't see any indications that this went up tied, which would make it make a little more sense. I, I'm not saying I love it that way either, but. I think I think I like it better than just straight up deep in the money puts. <laughs> that's that's I mean that at that point, yeah. I mean you're paying the price of the stock. If you're just buying the puts, you're paying the price of the stock to hedge it till January. Yeah, again, a really odd uh, an odd thing. It's it's like one of these nobody really knows what these these companies with this opioid liability is. If it comes into you know if it comes into play, a, a very speculative um, play still, but. I mean, these, these stocks have been driven to zero, so it's hard to kind of figure out what they're worth anymore. I mean, they're trading so below book value, uh, assuming that they have to pay this huge payout to uh, uh, the opioid crisis people. It's like, you know, all this stuff was happening and no, <laughs> nobody really did anything, I guess. They're just, well, we're going to just keep prescribing this stuff. I, I think everything's okay. <laughs> so um, very confusing. Uh very, very confusing. Uh, could be an opportunity, or it just could be a big piece of you know, piece of junk. So, I think this is a another company that's in the same problem, and I, I have to imagine maybe they're doing some kind of put in stock thing, maybe putting on the synthetic, um, you know, or maybe they just they bought stock. Hard to tell with this one, but you know. Buying the four dollar put on a two dollar stock is 
I yeah, I'm. It is perplexing. Let's just say that one. <laughs> Wherever the viceroy is right now, his ears are burning and he's angry. He doesn't know why, but he is. He is definitely. Let's move on to happier, less unsettling paper. We're going to put that one, by the way, listeners, in the to be watched category. So we will come back to see how our friend feared there in his MNK puts his head scratching. MNK puts. Meanwhile, let's go on to less controversial name, Citizens Financial Group, ticker symbol CFG. They are popping off after the bell, I believe, tomorrow. And let's see what we got. This is the name that's kind of been uh, all over the place over the past year, kind of peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. A year ago, it was trading about 35 almost 36 bucks. not that far north of where it is right now. Uh, topped out at around, looks like, 38 and change, then sold off hard on the Christmas Eve sell-off. They're down to 28 and change, so sold off about 10 handles. Then rallied right back up again by February. is back up to almost 38 again. Then it sold off again to 31, back up to 36. You see where I'm going with this, back and forth and back and forth, up and down. In that range, the low 30s up to the mid to the high 30s, back and forth, back and forth. And then lately, we sold off again down to about 32 and a half before it bounced back up to where it is right now, 34.80, actually off 30 cents. Uh, today so we're kind of in the middle of that recent range here let's see what's going up out here cfg our eye of sauron picked up the nov 35s going up for a buck 10 this was on the bid these were a buck 10 at a buck 30 this guy wasn't playing around he wasn't holding out for a penny or two more nope he said buck 10 done i'm hitting it 8500 times Uh, this was opening this is pre-earnings which are indeed tomorrow so this is has some earnings juice baked into it maybe someone deciding obviously maybe he likes this range they're in doesn't think they're going to blow through it too much if it does he gets a buck of upside so he goes up to 36.10 on the upside and if the earnings are a little bit of a dicey or quiet prospect then he gets to keep most of that pretty quickly i'd imagine mr rock lobster what do you think about this nov call over right here pretty much at the money call over right in citizens financial group yeah, you know, trade like this, it's a li- this is like a kissing your sister trade, you know, just it, why, 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 why write the call for a dollar? You know, you got November, you had dollar ups. <laughs> I just don't see the point of it, basically. Why, why do this right? I, I, it, why bother? I guess, you know, you get taken out, you make your buck or whatever, but, uh, which is, you know, it's still a buck. Um, but, uh you got earnings coming out. You're holding it through the earnings for – you're basically holding the trade through earnings for a dollar. So it seems like more risk than reward than it's worth. That that would be my take on this one. Yeah, it's not a lot of juice. But the guy wants his, his buck 10 8,500 times, and uh, he doesn't care what the Rock Lobster thinks. He wants his buck 10. <laughs> Let's move on to our final name. If you haven't had enough cheapy pharmaceutical names, we got one more for you. This is everyone's favorite, Ziopharm Oncology, Inc., tinker symbol Ziop, Z-I-O-P. Trading today, $3.96, so off about a nickel. That puts it off pretty much a little bit shy of the $4 range or $4 handle. Over the course of the past year, let's see, a year ago it was trading 2 and a half bucks. So it's a wee bit north of that. And it's pretty much been a, not a, I wouldn't say a direct upside route. There's been some peaks and troughs along the way as you are bound to see in any pharma name out there but pretty much the net move has been upside has a decent swing here looks like in june went from four bucks straight up to six over the course of about a week or so so it looks like they might have had their their last earnings season or maybe a drug announcement there either way or an approval either way something popped them up their 52 week high is actually seven and a quarter which they hit looks like back in august Uh, their 52 week low is a buck 56 so they've had quite the quite the range over the past year they're settling off now right in the middle of that down to right around 395 or so again. Let's go see what we are, our eye of Sauron found. Looks like it's far less controversial paper, far less head-scratching paper here too, Mr. Rock Lobster. Looks like it's just some straight-up old-school call love. Once again in January was the Jan 5 halves going up 2,171 times for 30 cents. Lift in the offer. They were 15 cents at 30. Someone decided to sweep these on the Philly and said, how many you got? We'll take them all. For thirty cents, this is opening. Uh, there are earnings coming up on the seventh of November, so there are earnings baked in to this name. So five and a half, Mister Rock Lobster. That seems pretty distant from where we are right now, three ninety five. But if you look back to August, there was trading about seven bucks, so it doesn't seem that distant. Either way, we got someone swinging at the bat, 
couple thousand times for 30 cents here for a nice pop up to five and a half by jam. Mr. Rock Lobster, take us home. What do you think of this call of here in Zio Farm Oncology, Inc.? Um, you know, it's definitely, definitely upside buying paper, um, wanting a little bit of a pop and maybe they got a drug coming out, you know, you know, you never know. Um, so I, that's what it feels like. I mean, and, and, you know, and the, and the, the, now there's the calls look 30 bid. So again, you could probably, you could probably push a, a Q-tip through that market. It's so. <laughs> it's so thin, um, and I don't blame the liquidity providers because you know those those uh, those pharma biotech stocks can be awfully sketchy with uh, liquidity and the way those things can move. So um, this is like the classic to be watched. Apparently, there's a little bit of apparently there looks like a little bit of upside uh, love in the stock. Just for reference, somebody paid eight cents for the twelves, the Jan twenty twelves. There's a loan three lot out there. So somebody's really, – they're like, if, if they like them at five, they love them at 12. Three lot. I love it. That's great. You paid more for commissions than those options are worth. But hey. Yes. And I, and I hope they all make money. But um, as we know uh, – so this is – this has got the – this has the whiff of upside spec. Upside spec love. Yeah. And you go out to April – there's there's call buying everywhere. Vol is up, so you know you sat in a pit long enough. The call buyers come in, the vol goes up. You know it doesn't always happen, or maybe they're front running some news or some sort of biotech newsletter. Um, you know said, hey, this is thing this is the next coming thing. Um, so it, it has the it has the appearance and smell of that kind of paper to me. Well, then we shall put it in our to-be-watched category as well. Two out of three today on the to-be-watched and a standing 30-cent bid for these five halves coming out, listeners. So maybe, maybe that override attracts you out there either way, or maybe you want to you join the partay. But either way, uh, they're still bid out. So it looks like maybe, maybe the upside game is afoot here in Zyop. We shall see. We're going to watch this one as we keep on rolling. Time for your questions. It is time for the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. This is your segment. I mean, they're all really your segments, but this is directly your segment because you guys get to dictate what we talk about. Well, let's kick it off back, get our fidelity kind of question of the week, kicking it off here. And I know Mr. Song of Ice and Fire sounds like... In this micro-focused week, you've been getting a lot of questions these days about maybe the old school, the old school question of whether it is noble or not to hedge your portfolio with puts or indeed put spreads. Would you say that's fair, sir? I would, I would say that's fair. It seems to be a common follow question we get. Um, interesting enough, when we get this question, and it's not only um, – because uh, we, when we teach class about hedging, we'll we'll get questions about incorporating something like going out and buying a put spread, but also when we have individualized uh, conversations uh, with people who are trying to hedge your portfolio, uh, they always throw out the idea: Well, why wouldn't I just buy a put spread? I'm putting up less capital, and indeed, I'm hedging to the downside. Um, I would say, kind of twofold uh, that. Uh, I wanted to cover with something like this that I cover with them, which is number one, uh, you know, if you could guess exactly where the sell off stops, that's wonderful. Uh, but I don't have that crystal ball. So, uh, you're really taking a risk because your, your protection, of the downside ends wherever that leg that you sold, it's over, right? So you're no longer hitched that downside when you sell that extra put, your hedge actually ends. Uh, so that's that's one thing to take into consideration when putting this on. And the other was actually psychological. Now, I've noticed that a, pe- a lot of people, when they're looking to buy the put spread, they even though they, they're setting up and have the initial impression that I'm using this as a hedge, their, uh, their thought process that goes towards this put spread turns into a speculative trade. Now they're treating it more like a trade instead of a hedge. 
And it always brings it back to, okay, what is your intentions with this? So would I say buying a put spread would be the most effective way to hedge a portfolio? I would say it really isn't just due to the fact that your hedge stops. And the majority of the time, people think of a put spread or buying a put spread as a speculative trade on, on direction. I'll be interested to see what everyone else thinks. Uncle Mike, that sounds like fighting words. I know you like yourself a nice put spread to hedge your portfolios. What do you have to say back to the Song of Ice and Fire, sir? Are you just in an uproar right now? He has the temerity to question put spreads as a portfolio hedge, sir. It's a partial hedge. I mean, you, you have to understand the tool. And that do I think it can be used as a tool? Yes. Um, but you have to have an understanding and a mentality to where, let's say the stock is at $70 a share and you like the stock at 70, but you love it at 60. Then if you're looking to hedge a 70, 60 put spread, wouldn't be so bad to where if you're fine taking on that risk, all a put spread is, is it's a temporary hedge for a slight pullback. Uh, that's how I view it whenever I use it. Uh, but you have to have a holding mentality longer than the life of the put spread. If you're trying to use this as a hedge and an end-all, be-all catastrophe hedge, then I agree absolutely with both ice and fire for that matter. Um, I think he's absolutely right. Um, but if you're looking to use the tool as the tool was meant to be used, uh, then I think it definitely has a place. I mean, uh, I've definitely used it through the years. I will continue to use it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of good things with which you can do with it, especially when um, you get to a point to where, yes, you could treat it as a trade. But let's just say for just a crazy example, my stock's at 70, goes up to 85, and then the value of my 60 short put is down at a nickel. Well, I have no problem buying to close that put. Uh, because of the fact that it's not doing anything with which I need it to do anymore. Um, Yes, it would technically be a trade, but with that being said, um, you have to have the ability to just do things that make sense. And I think that even when you are using something as a hedge, uh, it doesn't make any sense to hold a short option if it's worth a nickel or less or something along those lines. So um, I agree with Ice and Fire, but I just have had a little something to add to it in that – it can be a valid tool, but understand what the tool does. If all of a sudden the stock goes down to 50, uh, your, 70, your stock is at 70, it goes down to 50, you have the 70, 60 foot spread, and you're mad because it didn't hedge you enough. Well, the problem isn't the tool itself. The problem is uh, the person using the tool didn't use the right tool for what they wanted. Uh, and to be mad at the foot spread if it doesn't do its job, I think it's like being mad at a hammer for not being able to screw in a screw, quite frankly. Tool, my take on it. Mr. Rock Lobster, we got one kind of anti uh, put spread take, one kind of pro. So we got two kind of middle of the road opinions. Where do, where do you fall here on uh, on the put spread and its efficacy as portfolio hedging tool, sir? Well, I think the land of ice and fire. I like what he said. It's one of my favorite things to tell my students: is what is your intent? Like, what are you trying to do with the trade? So when you buy a put spread, you realize that you're not not going to get all the goodies from the put spread until expiration. Most of the time, the value of the put spread will linger somewhere between half the distance in the strikes, and it will slowly gain in value as the market moves toward the short end. So the first question is, is do you have, have the patience to watch your put spread slowly gain in value while the market tanks? Um, that's what I would uh, say there. So can it make you some bucks? Um I, as soon as you spread something, I tend to think of it as, you know, like a hedge for another trade or a cheaper way to kind of get something done. So I think it it provides some downside protection, but you, you know, and then I got, I'm just being a wimp here because I'm agreeing with Ice and Fire and I'm agreeing with Tucson because it only gives you like a partial you know, partial love, and you're really not getting the whole love until the end. I would say, though, that if you're if you're using it for a hedge, you have to decide, am I going to take the money? Am I going to just hold on to it, let the thing go all the way in the money, the market goes down, I'm going to sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until I have max gain or when the market rips back up again and then my spread isn't worth anything anymore. So you have to decide, I think, another thing that's important is, what you are doing with a gain in the in that hedge. So when you make money with it, are you going to just take the money and go buy more underlying, right? Because that's ultimately how you make money in the stock market. 
you buy st- things low and you sell them high. Um, and if you have a hedge that's – you're using that to generate dollars when the market falls apart. Part that way your PL doesn't look bad for the day, but then you go take that money and use something else. So you really have to have you have to be committed to what your decision is because you can go crazy with indecision once the market starts moving. Like, oh, should I wait? Should I not wait? Should I take it? Should I not take it? Very, very hard if you don't have a really good plan on how to exit it. So what I would say is it is a hedge. Um, it's not a perfect hedge because you really can't. Um, you can only gain partial but the more important thing is just deciding to do what to do with the money once you make it there you go we got three three middle of the road most of them colin was against them over there on put spreads i'm not i'm not as anti put spread as long as you understand the limitations of what you're putting on there Uh, because for a lot of people it is a a very difficult i can talk about many times if you just go out and try to just buy straight up three or five percent out of the money puts on the S&P all the time and, and make that uh, somehow work into your portfolio in and of itself, that's, that's a huge drag without doing something else, whether it's a put spread, whether it's a collar, whether there's something else. Uh, Uncle Mike has talked about doing all sorts of different things about you know levering it to some time type put spreads and things. There's a lot of things you have to do. But you have to do something to try to pay for that put. Otherwise, it's a beer. <laughs> so that's why I think the put spread has its use case as long as you understand exactly the limitations that you have going in there. We talk more about this, but we've got to keep going into our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, let's go back around the horn the way we just went. Let's start in the land of the Song of Ice and Fire. Mr. Colin, what's on your radar for the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Uh, I'm just going to give a very general answer. It's going to be earnings. Uh, I'm really focused to see how it's come out. I mean, we've already, we're in, we're, just jumping into it now, so it's already been really, uh, really exciting seeing it work itself out. I am uh, also going to be watching the S and P and how it's reacting around that three thousand level. Uh, it it does <laughs> seem to have a tough time to work itself through this level. So uh, you know, right now it's at three thousand, so it's going to be interesting to see how it reacts from there. And if I had to look a little bit further down the road, at the end of the month, there is going to be that Fed decision. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of there and the language they use. Uh, so those are some of the things that I'm really uh, kind of eyeing down the road. Mr. Rock Lobster, you got all your future premium and the ball products. You got all this madness, dogs and cats living together, sir. What What is on your radar for the rest of the week? <laughs> uh, yeah, just seeing, uh, you know, it's a full life watching that future premium expander contract. Uh, earnings for the most part have been, I think, okay. Um, you know, the market is not expecting great stuff because of all the worry about the trade war. Um, but I'd like to see how long this future premium can last. So I think if you're a vol seller person that does iron condors and stuff like that, um, you could be going into an area for the next, I don't know, three, four, five days where you might not see a lot of premium, like that juice might not come in very well. Um, and I use that future premium as kind of an indicator for that, where everybody's kind of waiting, 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 then boom, boom it's going to drop. So you might have to you – you would be selling options to not make a lot of decay over the next few days. That's my prognostication. Of course, you take that for what it's worth. Um, and we're really looking to see – got Brexit going on possibly this weekend, the vote, good or bad, and we could see a little – bit of a markdown and fall or not where everybody gets all worried again um so that's what i'm looking at and waiting for the big tech earnings to come out uh because that time is a coming well we got 24 hours to have a nice little pop and ball as you asked at the top of the show i was at about a 1665 a rare week where i kept myself the same part of that because our, our buddy mr simon over there from T3 went at a 1620. So he took where I wanted to be a little bit lower down on the 16 spectrum. And you, Mr. Rock Lobster, were a very Columbus appropriate 1492. So, <laughs> so you're closer than the rest. Oh, you're... that's right. The Columbus one. I'm right on the money, man. Well, you were. You're, you're over a handle away now, though. So we, ha- we have, to, have to be within yeah. the one point range to, to consider it a victory. Yes, right? yes, to right claim right now victory. It's, it's 1375. Well, again, 24 hours, and many things can unfold. In that front time frame, tune into Ball Views to more listeners so we can determine 
who our winner is. Should have a fun guest on the show tomorrow, too. And last but not least, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, take us home. What are you watching for the rest of this week? Well, um, just to echo the sentiments of the ice and the fire, um, watching the 3,000 mark. That, along with earnings, I think the 3,000, it's very interesting in that we're going into earnings season at this 3,000 mark, um, that we have a catalyst that can push us either way. And uh, you know, I've referred to 3,000 oftentimes as a magnet. Uh, the magnet continues to be strong, but uh, we'll see if earnings can break the strength of this magnet, either for better or for worse. We shall see indeed. Unfortunately, we shan't see on this show because that music means we are done. Let's quickly go back around the horn, check in with everybody, see what they have cooking. That may interest you. Let's start. Let's start with Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike, sir, folks are intrigued. They want someone to walk them through this put spread versus put thing and everything else. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? I can talk for hours on put spread versus puts. Can your financial advisor do that? If he can't, then give me a call. I'll talk to you about put spreads versus puts as a way of hedging the portfolio. Those and cons of each. Feel free to contact me by reaching out from me on the website at uh, stcharleswealth.com. Trust me, listeners, he can. He's called me up sometimes like 2, 3 a.m. and just wants to just go on and on about Put spreads versus puts. And I'll tell you, you know, Mike, I, I have to sleep. <laughs> so do me a favor. Take him off my hands. Call him up and let him regale you for hours about put spreads versus puts. And Mr. Rock Lobster, they want someone to maybe also explain to them the efficacy of different strategies. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, go to Option Pit. Go to our store. Listen, if you're at, listening to this show, I'll give you VIX Made Easy, VXX Made Easy for half off. Send me a note, Andrew, at OptionPit.com. You will not find a better way to learn about how to trade VIX or VXX than those two courses. Um, so go to optionpit.com, and Mark is doing a webinar tonight uh, on being a better trader. There you go. So if you're listening live, you can check that out. Maybe we get the show out to you. We'll see what time it gets out there. Uh, you might be able to hear this before that webinar as well. But head on over to optionpit.com. Let the Rock Lobster know. You get some, get some, get some half-off deals. Take them yeah, while the getting is good. And last but not least, Mr. Song of Ice and Fire if folks want to learn more, maybe they want to kick the tires for themselves over there in Fidelity Land, kick the tires on them, their options. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, so if they can log on to the website, fidelity.com slash options, uh, gives you information about our offering, ranging from tools to help you with your analysis, uh, as well as we have online classes uh, that allow uh, people where they can virtually join the class, learn about the different concepts, whether it's charts or option concepts or even discussing puts versus put spreads uh we're here to help them out uh through these classes and they can also submit their questions or on top of that you could always give us a call at uh, 877-907-4429 ask to speak with the trading strategy desk that's why we're here you could even ask for me directly ask for the man call him up say i demand to speak for the song of ice and fire don't try to pawn me off on that last Emperor guy or that last Data Crypt, any of those guys, I want the song of ice and fire. Give him to me now. That's what you need to say. Fidelity.com slash options is the place to go to begin your journey. So then you can call up and ask for Colin and Trey and all the rest of those guys over there. And on behalf of the song of ice and fire and Uncle Mike and the Rock Lobster and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for all the fun stuff that you do. Keep those questions coming. We love to hear from you guys. We'll see you back here, well, in a little bit, in about half an hour for Twifo. Stay tuned for that. Then coming back here tomorrow, we'll be live again, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern for Ball Views. Then we kick it all off again on Monday with more of the Option Block. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. 
For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options. StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.